So we'll start with our sponsored lightning talks. Sponsors are permitted to include commercial messaging in their talks. So don't be surprised if they try and sell at you. First of all, we've got John Fredrickson from our platinum sponsor, Free Agent. Over to you, John. Hi, I'm John Fredrickson. I head up platform engineering at Free Agent. I want to share some tips and some learning along the way that really helped us estimate, deliver, and reduce stress around a large cloud migration project. Some people may not have heard of Free Agent. We provide accounting software as a service to UK micro businesses. So we wanted to move Free Agent from our data centers to AWS. We started in early 2019 and we expect it to be done this summer. But by November of 2019, we knew we weren't going to hit this summer. We needed to replan and reforecast to show when we'd actually land. I'm sure these questions will be pretty familiar to anyone who's ever managed a project or a team. When will Free Agent be fully in AWS and out of our data centers? How are we tracking towards that? How good are the estimates? A conversation with the lead of my analytics team in late 2019 around the difficulties of planning and estimating gave me some new insight. I wanted to try a technique I'd heard about to see if it helped my biggest project. But first, why is estimation so hard? It seems I'm not the only person who struggles with estimates. In The Clean Coder, Robert C. Martin says, estimation is one of the simplest yet most frightening activities that software professionals face. I can certainly identify with all of that. An estimate is not a commitment. It's basically a guess. We make estimates because we don't know for sure how long something will take. Let's look at an example, a case study from history. The Pope simply wants to know how long it's going to take to get his chapel ceiling painted. Michelangelo gives an estimate of around three years. Now we don't know if Michelangelo had a favored estimation technique. Let's imagine him using one particular technique, the one free agent used as an example. We used PERT, a technique developed by the US Navy in the 1950s, and this combines three estimate types. Firstly, an optimistic, and this should be a wildly optimistic estimate. Then a nominal or expected, and then a pessimistic, which should be wildly pessimistic and have less than a 1% chance of happening. Some of these estimates are quite fun to come up with. Let's assume Michelangelo thinks optimistic is a year. He expects three years, but pessimistic, 12 years. We're now at the point where we can create a distribution from those numbers. So there's approximately a 60% chance that three years would have been a correct estimate. That's still a large percentage that it wouldn't hit three years though. Let's take a rapid look at how the maths of the PERT technique could have helped Michelangelo. So the PERT expected duration is the optimistic plus four times the nominal plus the pessimistic all divided by six. So a simple weighted average. The uncertainty is the pessimistic minus the optimistic divided by six. That comes from the PERT project research. Let's see how Michelangelo's numbers work out. His expected duration would be 4.2 years and the uncertainty would be 1.8 years. A better estimate for him to have given the Pope would have been a little over four years, your holiness, but it might take up to six years. Even longer is possible, but not likely. That's a simple exercise. What's more interesting is that the technique extends well to work with multiple tasks. This is where it came in useful for free agent. We estimated some epics, not everything via this technique. So here's an example with multiple tasks. The expected duration for multiple tasks is a simple addition of the PERT expected numbers. So here our three tasks would take 14 days in total. The uncertainty of the sequence isn't a straight sum. It's the square root of the sum of all the squares. We tended to be pessimistic and use double this combined uncertainty. Perhaps our engineers weren't as pessimistic as PERT expects off the bat, but initial experimentation and manual review showed that those numbers were more relevant to the case at Free Agent. So how did it work out for us? Well, here's our plan, and we tracked well to the nominal dates. We only estimated our epics. We did make a couple of staffing changes to add a few people into key teams along the way, because we definitely wanted to hit our November target and avoid making significant changes over Christmas. We're in November right now, and so far we're on target with our current plan. I'm superstitious, and I don't want to start the celebrations until we've totally landed it. If you think any of this is useful, Google PERT calculator, and I'm happy to share the version free agent used for multiple tasks, since there isn't an easy one to come across for that on Google. In conclusion, other techniques are available to assist with estimation. Find one that works well for you. Regardless of the technique used, estimates are still guesses that come with uncertainty. Even the uncertainties are uncertain. But if you have a large uncertainty to using PERT, ask yourself, is it possible to reduce this? Maybe you can do some exploration work 
or maybe you could further break down the tasks to estimate it in better shape. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, John. Next up, we have a talk from Detectivi, who are our gold sponsors. Here is Carolyn. My name is Carolyn Solskjær, and I work as the community manager for Detectivi Crowdsource. And what we do is that we automate the knowledge of over 250 hand-picked ethical hackers. We work with hackers to get security information from the hacker to tech organizations as fast as we can. Our record at the moment is 15 minutes, which is, if I can brag a little bit myself, quite impressive. Detectify Crowdsource is a part of Detectify, a company founded by ethical hackers. And they built the company on the simple idea that the internet is broken and that there should be a product to help fix it. This is of course not an easy mission and our founders realized that their own brain power wasn't enough. They needed to include more people but they couldn't hire all of them. So they turned to the power of the crowd. The easiest way to describe us would be to say that we are a bug bounty platform, but we're not. At least not in the traditional way. Because traditional bug bounting is a quite complicated and slow process that includes that the hacker needs to write and send individual reports to each affected company. In other words, not a scalable process. And if the desired outcome is to make the internet safer, there needs to be a better way of distributing security knowledge. Detectify Crowdsource approaches bug bounty in an innovative way, where we focus on platforms instead of specific clients. So when an ethical hacker submits a vulnerability to us, we build a module for it and then add it to the Detectify service. So by reporting a vulnerability to us, the hacker only has to report it one time, but it helps to secure hundreds of websites through automation. And this is how Detectify combines automation and crowdsourcing. Many people have a very specific picture in their head when we talk about a hacker, an uh, introverted person hiding behind a screen in, uh, in a black hoodie. But this is of course not always the case. And in our crowdsource community, we have all types of people from all over the world. And these are four of the personas that we can see. Uh, and for full disclosure, these are only my own reflections from talking with the hackers in our community. But uh, some of them are students who are using the money that they earn to support their way through their education. Some are security experts or developers with an interest in security. And what drives these individuals, apart from getting an extra income, is that it's a great way to learn new skills and to make sure that you're always up to speed with the newest technologies. Some are pen testers who realize that they often find bugs that are not applicable to their work. They still want to report these bugs and make sure that they are fixed. And then the Detectified Crowdsource could be a great solution. And some are, of course, full-time ethical hackers who found a way to earn a living and make the internet safe at the same time. And that sounds like a dream job, if you ask me. What we all have in common is the goal of making the internet a safer place by securing technologies that we love to use. We all bring our different skill sets and point of views to the table, and we need them all to help fix the internet. And we also need you. We are always looking for new talents, people within the tech and security industry with a passion for making the internet safe. So if you ever thought about becoming an ethical hacker, or if maybe I in some way has planted that seed right now, Detectify Crowdsource could be something for you. If so, you can go to our website to read more, or you can send me an email and I promise you that I will tell you everything about the amazing world of ethical hacking. We have built a platform where we can get the best ethical hackers of the world to unite and help them speed up the process of reporting bugs. That's really cool. And I'm very excited to continue to build the future of internet security, powered by the crowd. And thanks, Carolyn. Now, I hope it's not considered a faux pas to do this. Um, I'd like to introduce myself, John Topper uh, from The Scale Factory. We're also a gold sponsor this year. Hi, this is John from The Scale Factory. I'm here today to tell you that your video calls are the worst. So we've been stuck at home since March. Uh, 
obviously with this pandemic going on we've spent a lot of time working from home you've probably spent a lot of time working on zoom or teams or possibly chime if you've been very unlucky or you've had to speak to someone from amazon nobody else uses chime uh, and you'll have found probably that it's been quite tiring there's this thing that the press refers to as zoom fatigue um, which is essentially means that your your brain's having to work harder to process the audio and visual information uh, in the conversations that you would normally if you were face to face with someone have no trouble processing but uh, zoom adds an extra layer of difficulty in uh, in following that and so uh, probably um, you are getting tired at the end of the day uh, just as i am uh, and part of the reason for that is uh, that your connectivity is the worst you uh, you're probably on a wireless network and wireless networks are uh, notorious for introducing jitter uh, jitter is the variation in packet delay um, and for real-time uh, video uh, applications like zoom and teams uh, jitter really is the is the worst thing uh, for that um, and uh, so the other problem is that uh, residential areas have uh, many many wireless networks in them this this area i can see hundreds of them from my uh, if i look in my uh, wireless network explorer um, and uh, if you are using 2.4 gigahertz then obviously those would be affected by microwaves and baby monitors and other things in, in and around that frequency um, so uh, what i did is i, I measured the uh, the ping time between my laptop and my router uh, on the left is the ping time uh, measured from a wired connection you can see that uh, the ping remains under one millisecond each for, for the entire minute um, and, uh, and it's pretty consistent on the right uh, I'm getting uh ping times up to 160 milliseconds uh, so you can see there's a lot of jitter there which is uh, terrible for zoom and my wireless access point is a ubiquity um, access point it's a it's a decent bit of kit and it's about four meters behind me uh, so uh, e even good kit not far away is going to cause you this sort of problem so the best thing you can do is to get a wire plug a wire in um, and if you can't reach from your uh, your computer to uh, the the access point uh, with a wire uh, maybe consider these uh, these power line network adapters which cost about 30 quid and, and work just fine um, uh, part of the other problem is that your video is the worst and i'm not saying that your camera is bad although it probably is that doesn't really matter too much um but you're probably not well lit and if you're not well lit people can't see your face if they can't see your face they have to work harder to understand how you're feeling um during the call um and so uh, lighting yourself well is a is a good way to improve the video call quality for everybody involved uh you could spend 190 quid on these elgato key lights if you were a streamer or you wanted to be one um but you don't have to spend that much uh, i bought a couple of niwa uh, led lamps which were about 45 quid um, and they did the job just fine uh, my face is currently lit with one of them sat on top of my camera uh, but the problem also is that your audio is the worst uh, and particularly if you've uh, been on a video call recently with uh, people who are not wearing headphones you'll hear the effect of the uh, the echo cancellation or, or possibly you'll even hear yourself echoing back um, this is pretty awful uh, when the echo cancellation ducks the volume of the mic so, so that it stops picking up the uh, the echo it's also going to duck the volume of the mic for the speaker's voice as well uh, and so you won't hear what they're saying so um, really everybody needs to be wearing a pair of headphones um, the worst thing about this is that if there's only one person on the call who is not wearing headphones uh, they don't actually notice that there's a problem because they can't hear the echo themselves which is uh, pretty bad so um, do put a pair of headphones on uh, if you are going to be on a call uh, I bought a pair of uh, Sennheiser M2s they're really comfortable but you don't need to be spending that sort of money um, you can literally use anything pretty much uh, bear in mind that Bluetooth headphones introduce a small audio delay which uh, can also contribute to fatigue but um, I find it's not too bad and I can actually plug it in with a wire if I if I need to um, also on the topic of your audio being bad um, your microphone is probably bad as well a microphone built into your laptop is um, is going to be picking up audio from all the way around itself so on the left hand side of it here um, is a, um, a polar polar graph of a, of a microphone with a circular polar pattern uh, your uh, laptop mic probably has one of these so it's picking up uh, the fan that's in the mic in the laptop itself and the dishwasher in the background and so forth uh, on the right is a cardio polar pattern which is uh, a type of pattern uh, for a microphone that only picks up audio from a particular direction um, that's what i'm using today uh, you can see on the left there um, the noise floor of the microphone in the in the laptop is picking up quite a lot of just noise uh, fans and, uh, and and dishwashers uh, on the right hand side uh, is the mic that i'm talking to you now with and uh, you see it picks up very little when when i'm not speaking into it um, this is a uh, Marantz MPM 2000U microphone. Um, it's uh, it was about 75 quid. Again, there are cheaper options available. You don't have to spend that kind of money, um, but uh, you should really invest in in your mic to to make people's lives a bit easier. Um, so uh, that's basically the story. You can improve your video calls by spending a bit of money on kit. It doesn't have to break the bank, but uh, everyone will thank you for it, uh, and I thank you for it. Thank you very much. 
And that concludes the sponsor lightning talks. Uh, now we go over to those that we've received from you, the viewer. First up, Michael Ramnerain on happy developer deployments. I'm Michael Ramnerain, and I'm going to tell you how we got to one step deploy. We inherited the monolith that runs our website and critical backend systems. It came with no tests and deployment was log into the server and run git pull origin master. Now running git pull without origin master breaks the site. That's something you're only allowed to happen once. It was a small project for a small business, perfect for getting to market, nothing more. We saw the ambition to grow and we thought that we could do better. Developers comfortable with deployment? Two of two. Process? Trivial. Then we hired a UI developer. Front-end changes required cache busting. Now deployment was logging into the server and running three commands. By this point, we also had unit tests and Docker containers for our local development. Developers comfortable with deployment? Two of three. Complexity low. Our website was looking much nicer, but load times were still slow. We added a static site generator to our stack. The team grew and we were able to work on tooling alongside other development efforts. Now we had a containerized workflow in production and we'd added integration and acceptance tests in the meantime, but we still needed to log into the server to deploy. We had scripted some of it, but it needed babysitting. Developers comfortable with deployment? Two of five. Complexity medium. We acknowledge the resistance around deploying to production. This new service and development were fine, but production needed some work. So we found the pain points and worked on them. We created a command line script that would run from local, then log into the server and run the required steps. We tested it thoroughly and we were sure that it worked. We had help from some of the newer team members too. Developers comfortable with deployment? Four of six. Complexity, low. Memories of failed deployments still made some of the team feel uncomfortable. Our CTO suggested, why not add a button to our build pipeline? We already had the script, and by this point we were familiar with Docker and the pipeline tooling. Adding something to the web pages that we were already familiar with felt safer and more polished. It gave the entire team visibility of our high success rate and made partial rollouts impossible. Developers comfortable with deployment? Six of six. The way we roll out our DevOps tooling is user experience. Automated deployments have saved us time every week since. But we could have stayed with the command line script. But for me, that last step is where the magic happens, when all of the frustrations are forgotten, when the complexity we have added becomes invisible. Aim for nothing less. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Now we're going to hear from Lindsay Proer from Equal Experts, who's going to be talking about running chaos days on large platforms. Hello, my name's Lindsay. I'm going to be talking to you for five minutes about how we can improve the resilience of our services by running chaos days on our systems. Chaos days help us uh, to understand better how our services respond to these different combinations of failure and allows us to improve the resilience of our systems and also improve how we respond to uh, these incidents. In a chaos day, we would design some experiments whereby we deliberately induce failure into the system. We then observe how that state failure ripples throughout the system. So how, what, what, how does it uh, surface in our uh, monitoring uh, tools and how do other components get impacted by it? We then reflect on what we observed and we've also reflect on not just how the system behaved, but how uh, the people that were dealing with the that simulated incident uh, responded to it. Did they have the right uh, visibility into um, system behavior to understand exactly what was going wrong and what options they could do to fix it? Chaos days 
help us improve the resilience of our system, uh, as well as improving how we respond to um, problems. Chaos days also help teams think much more about production. So with every change they're doing to their, uh, their system, they're thinking more about how uh, that change might uh, respond to failure or what failures are um, could happen uh, because of that change. To run your own chaos state, the first step is to map out your own system. Get to your team around a whiteboard and sketch out your architecture. Then think about what the steady state is of your system. What's typical request volumes that flow through on a really busy day? What parts of your system do you have control over? What parts don't you have control over? With chaos engineering, we like to focus on, on running experiments on the parts that we can control uh, just to see how they respond to, to failures and then uh, understand what we can do to improve that response. Once you've mapped out your system, start brainstorming uh, about these different experiments. What parts of your system are you, is your team most concerned about? What failure modes do they least understand? Come up with a few, so no more than 10 different experiments that you'd like to run on your first chaos day. Then pick an environment. It doesn't have to be production, but it should be an environment that is as close to production in terms of realism as, as possible. That means uh, you should be able to put a, a significant enough load from it so that when you're running failures, that um, they will cause um, alerts or, or log messages that will surface in your telemetry. Your environment needs to have production like uh, logging and monitoring so you can actually see what's happening. You should also decide uh, how far you want your chain, your, your failures to ripple out, because there might be some parts of your environment uh, that you need to protect when you're running your chaos day. Decide also how you can simulate a real production instance in terms of your communication channels, are the specific Slack or Teams channels that you should be using, for instance. Then run your day, learn from it, and, and do it again. I'd encourage you to think about um, what you can do as a result of, of watching uh, this lightning talk. What's the next step that you can do with your team to Im improve their approach to chaos engineering and possibly run a chaos day? At Equal Experts, we've run chaos days uh, across a number of public and private sector clients, and we've shared our knowledge in our form of uh, playbook. We have various playbooks on both on chaos days, on, on building platforms, and on security. You can see them in the link below. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Lindsay. And finally, here's Chris Young reminding us that ridicule is nothing to be scared of. Ridicule is nothing to be scared of. These are my adventures in open telemetry. I've been looking at this functions as a service app. It's all being built through the UI and it needs infrastructure as code putting in place to make it more stable. To help me do this, I started drawing some diagrams to map the service out. But what was missing was the flow of data or messages, so I drew some, drew some good old UML sequence diagrams. But these very quickly came out of date as changes happened. And I began to think, am I ever going to be able to get an understanding of what's happening in the service? Then I remembered these guys. Skelton Thatcher, rocking Agile Cambridge a few years back. Matthew Skelton had introduced me to the idea of correlation IDs. Unique identifiers, a bit like parcel tracking numbers that let you see the flow of data or messages through a system. Google led me to open telemetry, the merging of open census and open tracing, which seemed to give me what I was looking for with its traces and spans. So how was I to go about applying this to these cloud functions? Well, the functions are written in Python and there is good documentation on how to instrument them. So they report trace activity broken down into spans within an individual application service, or in this case, a cloud function. But what I could not find was information on how to propagate the trace between functions to get the all-important correlation that would give me the big picture of how they work together. What I could find was the W3C trace context spec. But how did this fit into OpenTelemetry? And how could I get trace propagation over the Google PubSub message queues that connected the functions? I was stumped. Was this something I could build myself? Was I missing something fundamental? Had I failed to get it? If I built something which appeared to scratch my itch but was naive, would I end up looking like an idiot? Tech can often be a far from nurturing space, and flame wars are legendary. It was then that I remembered the words of Adamant. For those of you who don't know, Adamant is a pop hero from Planet 80s. Check him out. He sang in his song Prince Charming that ridicule is nothing to be scared of. So I put my implementation on GitHub and built this little 
demo app based around the song Prince Charming to bring it to life. Each verse of the song is represented by a cloud function, and the cloud functions are joined together by pub cell queues. Before each function hands off to the next one, it calls out over HTTP to a chorus function. The traces from each function are then collected by Jaeger and presented in the Jaeger UI. So let's take a look at it. Here we see the Python functions, a function for each verse and the chorus. In the first verse here, we see the lyrics being put out to the logs and then sent off to Jaeger through open tracing. And the whole thing is deployed using Terraform. Nah. Here we see the function in Google Cloud. We can go in and invoke it. So if we hit the test button here, this will put a message into the first pub sub queue and start the function off. And then if we pop over to the Jaeger UI, we can see the telemetry data, uh, the open tracing data uh, coming in. So we can open up and see, it's not come in yet. Let's see again. Here it is, services have started to appear. Here's verse one. We'll select verse one. And then we'll say, show us the traces. And you can see they're starting to come in here. We can narrow that down to a particular operation. We want to see this, the singing of verse one. So let's find that. And we see that's coming in. We can see that it's called the chorus. It's already gone on to call verse two. Wait a bit longer. I put some sleeps in to make it a bit more realistic. Um, and here you can see it's got as far as verse three. And in a minute, any time in it now, here we are. So now we can see the span, the sort of the trace of the whole song with the lyrics printed out. Don't you ever, don't you ever stop being dandy, etc. Um, and we can see how the, the dependency map between the different services. Weirdly, the choruses, I don't know why this is something I haven't figured out yet. The chorus doesn't seem to be linked in, even though it's it's passing the trace ID, the correlation ID, because it's appearing in the same trace, but the dependency doesn't seem to be there. And you see this in the system architecture. Jaeger's figured out that there's a dependency between the three services that are linked over pub sub queues, but not the not the um, the HTTP one. So I don't know, don't know what's going on there. Um, and if we scoot down here, we can see um, some more lyrics being presented out. We can see some information being dropped into uh, Jaeger here, so we can see. Um, uh, an error here, something funny going on here. I don't know what that is either, got to fix that. But I thought I'd end on this. We're all of us learning all the time, no matter how much we know about a subject. And I think it behoves us to embrace that and to help provide a safe to learn environment. Thank you for listening. Codes up on GitHub. See you around.